This is the third episode in a series covering the design and construction of a clock for my relay computer. In the last episode I considered various design options and ended up settling on two designs rather than one. The first is a purer option based on a relay ring counter and the second uses a 32.768 kHz crystal run through multiple frequency dividers. Whilst the second design can produce a selectable range of accurate frequencies, the first is certainly more in keeping with the computer's electromechanical theme. In this episode, I'll take a deeper dive on that first design, the relay ring counter, hopefully to the point where I can start breadboarding and trying the design out. OK, let's quickly recap on the high-level view from last time so we're ready for our dive into the detail. At the heart of this clock is a ring of relays which turn on and off in sequence like this. Only two neighbouring relays are ever on at any one time, and looking at the outputs of each relay, you end up with these repeating pulse trains. Based on these, we set the output clock signal high when A and D are high, or when B and C are high. The magic behind the magic is an RC network at each relay coil, which controls the length of time each relay is held on for. Let's take a closer look then at what's going on here. Now let's start with a single relay and see how that delay magic works. I mentioned that it uses an RC network, so named because it consists of a resistor and a capacitor. The capacitor can store a charge and the resistor can limit how quickly it charges and discharges. Now I'm going to ignore the RC values for now, but be warned, we'll obviously have to get into that topic later on. When power is provided, the relay switches on, but also the capacitor begins charging. After a given time, let's call that TC, the capacitor is fully charged. Now you might have guessed that by playing around with the values of the resistor and capacitor, we can change how long TC takes. When the main power source is removed, the relay draws power from the capacitor instead. This will keep it going until the capacitor is depleted. This also takes a certain amount of time, let's call that TD, before the voltage across the relay drops to the point it can't hold the contact closed anymore. Note also that the coil inside the relay has a known resistance, which forms part of the RC circuit. This ultimately means TD will be longer than TC. Once the capacitor is depleted, we're back to our starting state, awaiting a source of power. So we now have the basic relay and RC network design. Before we go any further, let's simplify this diagram a bit so it's easy to follow as we add more relays. Here now, the box at the bottom left of the relay represents the RC network and have elided away the ground routes. Also not shown is the flyback diode, which sits across the coil, but of course I'll need to ensure that's present in the final design. We'll need four of these relays to implement the ring counter, and as I mentioned earlier, each relay needs to initially take its power from somewhere to activate the relay and to charge at the capacitor. In this case, that will come by the normally open contact on the previous relay, like so. The first relay takes its feed from the last relay, forming a ring. The input to each of these relay contacts is then connected to the normally closed contact of the previous relay, effectively two behind the target coil. As before, the leftmost relay feeds from the rightmost, continuing the ring. If we now introduce a power source at these entry points like so, you can see that by default power flows through the first set of relay contacts and onto the next relay in the chain. At that point, if that relay were switched on somehow, it would allow power to pass through to the following relay in the chain. Let's take an example where the first and second relay are already on. Now ignore for the moment how we got the circuit into this state as that presents an interesting challenge for later. Here relay 2 is on because relay 1 is passing power through to it, and because power has been provided the capacitor is also charging. But what's powering relay 1? Its power supply is cut off by relay 4. Well, the only rational explanation is that it must be drawing power from its capacitor, which therefore is now discharging, and we've got a set amount of time before it's depleted. After a short delay, determined by the resistor and capacitor values, the voltage across the coil of relay 1 drops below the minimum required to operate the contacts, and the relay turns off. This cuts power to relay 2, but note also this now completes the circuit, providing power to relay 3. Relay 3 is activated, and the capacitor across its coil begins charging. We're now in a similar state to our starting position, except everything has moved on one relay. The process repeats itself, and as the charge runs out, relay 2 is de-energised, providing a route to power relay 4, 
leaving Relay 3 running off its capacitor. Likewise again, when Relay 3 turns off, Relay 1 receives power and Relay 4 is running off its capacitor. And when Relay 4 turns off, then Relay 2 receives power and Relay 1 is running off its capacitor. As long as power is maintained at the entry points, this circuit will continue this pattern. In terms of deriving the clock signal, we need to know when each relay is on. That's easy enough, as we can tap off a result on the top set of contacts like so. If we look at these outputs A, B, C and D over time, we get our timing diagram. Right, we're now at this point in the diagram, with the output A and B high. As mentioned earlier, we set the outgoing clock signal high when A and D is high, or when B and C is high. So, all good, yeah? Well, there's that one important thing I skipped over earlier. When you first power on the clock, this is the state you'll be greeted with. We need to find a way to kickstart the sequence and get the clock into its self-sustaining cycle. If you're feeling clever, feel free to pause the video and see if you can spot how it's done. If you're impatient, like me, then here comes the answer. To get started with this, let's focus on the point of relays receiving external power and its capacitor is charging. We can express this as a formula using the logical combination of the preceding two relays. This effectively represents the wiring we have in a logic formula. To make this a bit easier to follow, I've renamed the relays to lowercase letters a through d, uh, rather than numbers. When I now use a lowercase a for example, I'm referring to that relay receiving external power and capacitor charging. The uppercase A refers to the output of that relay being high. It will be high when the relay is powered either by the external power source or by the capacitor draining down. Here's what those formulas look like. Taking the example for relay C, relay C is receiving external power when relay B is on and relay A is off. Rather, C is true when B is true and A is not. This is the only time relay C receives external power and in this state, relay B is running off its capacitor. Bearing in mind the timing diagram shows the relay outputs, which are a combination of the relay being powered by external power and then by capacitor power, we can place this formula on the diagram. These formulas tell us that if any one relay could somehow be turned on, then the next relay would also be switched on and the circuit would begin operating. If we can just get one relay to come on, the cycle will begin. The secret is to alter the formula for relay A. We must ensure relay A has its power supplied at exactly the same time as before, but we want to achieve this in a different way. Looking at the timing diagram again, we know relay A should be powered externally here. If we detect this time interval, we can provide power to relay A, uh, which will get the sequence started without impacting it once running. Well, we know this time interval only happens when relay C is off and D is on, but that's no use to us in our initial state. What we need instead is a way of detecting this time period based on relays being off rather than on. Looking closer at the diagram, we can see that relay A is on when both B and C are off. Looking across the diagram, we can see that's the only time this holds true. Perfect, that gives us a useful alternative formula. Let's make this change to the ring counter wiring. This now feeds power through to relay A as follows which switches relay A on and begins charging its capacitor. Note that we only have one relay on currently, but power is about to be supplied to relay B. This doesn't happen immediately though, as there is a certain amount of time it takes the relay to operate and switch the contacts over. In the relays I use, that's around 2 milliseconds, at which point the power reaches relay B, which also turns on and its capacitor starts charging. And then around 2 milliseconds after that, its contacts change over removing power from relay A, which then stops drawing from its capacitor. Ideally by now, the capacitor will have a reasonable charge, perhaps not enough to last the full delay period, but enough to get the clock going. I'll have to factor in this start-up time when deciding what resistor and capacitor values to go for, of course, um, but from here we should be back to business as usual. Relay A switches off, leaving relay B running off its capacitor, and relay C can now draw external power. Relay B drops out and relay D comes on, Relay C drops out and Relay A comes on. Relay D drops out and B comes on. At which point we're full circle and the ring counter will then keep going on until the power is cut. Phew, um, quite a lot to take in, but uh, one final task remains before our ring counter is complete, deriving the clock signal. Let's clean up a bit first again. We know already that our clock signal is obtained by the following formula. 
when A and D are high, or B and C are high, then a clock signal is also high. Now that's a bit of a mouthful to be fair, and if we look at the timing diagram we can try and find a simpler equivalent. One pattern I can see is that C and D are always different from each other when the clock should be high, and the same when it should be low. This is effectively an exclusive OR combination. This is a much simpler approach, and an exclusive OR is much easier to wire out in the relays. Unfortunately though, I need to increase the number of relay contacts to make this work, but needs must. Let's do that now. Yes, and I, uh, I know the contacts on relay D are the wrong way around, but uh, here's the reason why. Because it makes the X all wiring much more pleasing to the eye. Anyhow, we provide power at the entry point on relay C, and the resulting clock signal will be available on the exit point at relay D. Actually, and I'm not sure how UK-centric this is, uh, the way these relays are wired is the same way light switches work on stairs. Uh, you can turn the lights on at the bottom of the stairs and then ascend and turn the lights back off again at the top of the stairs. It's basically an exclusive all circuit. And I think that's as good a place as any to leave it for this episode. Uh, I've got the ring counter design in place, uh, but there's some key information missing, and that's what the values for the capacitors and resistors should be. But I'll cover that next time, and beware, there'll be plenty of maths required.